Good evening, everyone. How's everybody doing? Welcome to this month's Musicians for Musicians panel. My name is Steve Hartman. Uh, I'd like to thank all the sponsors, the amazing volunteer staff, and tonight's panelists and musicians, and for all of you for making this such a uh, tremendous success and a great place to catch um, local, uh, local acts and to get some uh, interesting information about the do's and don'ts of, in the uh, creative field. Um, be sure to stick around tonight. Later on, singer-songwriter Marisa Smith, followed by Hot Flannel, uh, featuring fiddler Patrick Ross, will close out the night tonight. Tonight's panel focus is press, uh, the insights and advice from uh, the writer's perspective. Tonight's uh, distinguished panel. Um, back from uh, last year, uh, Brent Hollenbach from the Burlington Free Press, Dan Bowles from The Seven Days, and uh, this joining us for the first time is our, our friend Casey Ray. Welcome. How's everybody doing? Thanks for being here today. I'm just gonna dive right on in. Uh, Casey, this is the first time we've, uh, we've met. How are you? Excellent. Thanks for making the trip. No um, why don't you describe a little bit about what it is that you do and uh, how it differs from what uh, Dan and Brent do as a music editor and entertainment writer? Well, I think that I, uh, I used to do something that was similar to these two. I wouldn't say it was identical because I did it with more props um, <laughs> and interpretive dance. Uh, I, awesome. I used to well, work at Seven Days as a music editor probably about seven years ago, I would say. I've been in D.C. since then. Uh, I am the executive director of a nonprofit for musicians in Washington. We, uh, we conduct research, education, and advocacy for musicians. A lot of this stuff is uh, you know, conversations at the federal policy level, but uh, we're always paying attention to what's going on in local cultural communities. and. Uh, Local journalism is a huge part of that. You know, there's basically a handful of things that you really need in a thriving music scene, and you know, you need the folks making the music, the talented people that come together to make the sounds. You need some basic infrastructure stuff, like you guys have a low power FM station, you get the college station, you've got, you know, uh, you have a, a gigabit internet connection, I think, right? Yeah, so you guys are totally set up. Um, and you know, of course, the other part of it is just making sure that there's people to reflect what's going on in town, uh, you know, back to you and uh, hopefully kind of elevate the stuff that you're doing as individual musicians and bands and folks that are trying to make your way in music. Awesome. Uh, Dan and Brent, good to see you guys again. What's happening? Anything changed from last year? Nope. No. Awesome. <laughs> good to see you. Um, so why don't you briefly, do, uh, we'll uh, touch a little bit on what we talked about last year. What, what is it um, from a as as a Local singer, songwriter, everyone like myself wants to get out there and, and get as much press as possible. What do, does anyone actually at the, at the table have any idea of any kind of basic generic database that a person can go to to research um, places, uh, you know, different publications, even different authors that they might want to, to tackle and approach? Hmm. You guys can use it. I actually control it all from Washington just by myself. Awesome. So a monopoly right here. I, I do it with my mind. Um, <laughs> you know, it's kind of interesting. I, it's, it's a bit of a struggle. There's a certain level, it seems like, that you have to get to. And the best place to do that is probably in your, on your home turf, right? You know, create a buzz, get people to be aware of what you're doing. Uh, hopefully folks like Dan and Brent can, you know, cover your stuff or become interested and expand your, your network a little bit more beyond just, you know, the, your friends and, and uh, immediate family members. So that's kind of the first rung. I don't know that, I've never heard of a place that you could go to and just be like, okay, this is the target list for, for everybody that I want to write to. I know that when I, I'm a musician and, and, and uh, I put out records um, from myself and other people and Usually what I do per is project to project, right? Like I'll, I'll have a sense of what that project feels like, what it sounds like, who it's likely to appeal to. And you have to spend a certain amount of research trying to figure out who your, your, uh, you know, your targets for that your are. Your demographic, media. right? And I find that like sometimes the more niche the project, the more easy it is to get traction. You have very, very dedicated folks who are covering a very, very specific kind of music or a style. So that can help. Uh, even if they're just bloggers, you know, these are people who are passionate about it. Uh, it's a lot harder to get the attention of some of the big, you know, aggregators or tastemakers like Pitchfork. Um, you know, it's, it seems, feels idiosyncratic. Sometimes it's, uh, I've known bands that are very, very popular, like that you would know of, that have a hard time getting coverage in some of those outlets, or will get coverage one time and then they'll expect to get coverage for their next record and they just won't. So I think everybody feels that kind of like tension about how, uh, how to get anyone to notice. 
But I think a, a lot of what people do when they get to a certain level is they'll have a publicist that works for them. And the good news is it's a buyer's market. There's tons of people who are, who are capable of doing that job of, of publicity. It's going to cost you money. Uh, how much money you have to spend is basically probably uh, proportionate to how much work they're going to do on your behalf. Um, but, the, but since there's so many folks who are basically working in, in, as publicists, as contractors for a lot of different clients, um, you know, you can get a project, um, you know, you can get publicity for a project at a fairly decent uh, price, um, but it's, you know, that decent price might still be outside of the grasp of the average, you know, person. So I would say you start with your local networks, you build the buzz, I mean, it's kind of the same old, same old. You have new tools to accomplish that with the internet and stuff, but uh, the basic work is, is happening, like in getting good at your craft, uh, having fans come to your shows, getting guys like Dan and Brent to, you know, feel passionate about your music or, uh, you know, even if they hate it, they, they can feel passionate about it, right? <laughs> <coughs> I guess hate is a passion too, right? right. Um, yeah, I guess I would just add to that, um, you know, I, I get tons and tons of releases, just sort of generic um, releases from agencies representing, you know, whatever band um, that don't necessarily pertain to anything that I would necessarily write about. Um, so if you're, you know, a local band and you're starting to branch out and starting to go on tour, um, I would do a little bit of legwork. And if you're going to like Portland, Maine, and then Boston, and then Providence, or wherever, um, do a little research and find out what the publications are in each town um, that might, you know, be able to uh, to shed a light on on what you're doing and approach them directly. Um, the first things that get deleted uh, in my inbox are the generic mailers that come, you know, from you know. Band X telling me that they're the next Bob Dylan. Um, so. That would uh, that'd be my advice, I guess. What would they send you that would keep you from deleting my email? <laughs> <laughs> um, candy. Candy. Candy is always good. I was I told a, beer is not a good idea, although I do that all the time. I once got a, uh, a rock in the Can mail. It was yes. Like, it was just a rock. It told me to pick it up and put it to my ear. Um, I still have that it's sitting on my desk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a rock. It's not the same rock. You guys don't have <laughs> custody of the rock? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I think, you know, in, in someone like your case, Steve, um, what you would be pitching to me would probably be more pertinent to, you know, what it is that I'm looking to cover. So, you know, an interesting out-of-town act that's coming through mm -hmm. Vermont somewhere uh, that might be interesting to, you know, whoever might pick up the paper. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, kind of trying to come up with some sort of more personal connection um, and identifying what it is uh, a publication like Seven Days might be looking to put out there um, would probably be a, a good way to start you mm -hmm. know, for me not deleting your email. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think uh, like the kind of email you're talking about, I got a couple today, I think that like have your name in that bold. That you've deleted. The band's name in bold <laughs> and the venue's name in bold so you can kind of tell it's like a cut and paste kind of job. I've gotten a few to you too. <laughs> I, also, I also get a lot to Brett or to names that aren't really quite mine. But, um, <laughs> so I think that's an important piece too, is be very careful before you hit send. Just make sure you know, all the pertinent information is there and that it's correct and won't make you roll your eyes being called Brent and me being called Dan. So just, <laughs> just be careful with it. So make sure you have everyone's name right. Buy a rock or go get one. <clears throat> Put it in there with your CD and everything's good. Um, as, a, as a reporter, um, someone like me that sends you something like that, I personally would be looking for you know some kind of write-up or some some kind of press or, or promo to promote a gig, um, or something like that. Is there an effective way to approach you other than you know the standard like we just said you know the email and keeping it you know somewhat personal? I mean obviously I'm local, so going to you guys would be make sense. But if I wanted to go like you said out to you know to Portland or to Providence or DC, I have friends in with and something like that. How would, I, uh, how would I approach you other than you know, using a rock? I love that, I'm totally gonna use that. Well, I think that you know, uh, keeping in mind everything <coughs> Dan and Brent just said about you only have that one chance, so don't blow it, right? You know, people are, are very, very busy and they're distracted. And I know music journalists and like, we could basically start a Tumblr about the shittiest press releases we've ever seen. I can say <laughs> shitty on the internet, right? I mean, because there's some really bad stuff out there. Twice even. And, and twice. <laughs> There's no FCC on the internet. I know this for a fact. Um, anyway, uh, you know, so you get that one shot to make an impression, so don't blow it. But the other side of that is you really, um, I think that the, in today's really, really noisy environment, 
and it doesn't even, this is not just something that uh, affects music journalists, but everybody. I mean, how much time do you have to sit around and listen to every single piece of music on the planet? Uh, no matter how much you love music, you're going to rely on uh, other networks to tell you what the best stuff is. So just like, even though these guys kind of act as curators, they need curators too. So I think sometimes what has impressed me when I was doing music writing was somebody that I really trusted and admired and liked. You know, Brent's turned me on to music before. Uh, you know, and it's like, oh my God, have you heard this? And it could even be local stuff, right? right? So we rely on our networks too. So cracking that riddle, it's harder to do. You can't just hire a publicist who's gonna, you know, be able to set it and forget it. But your job as an artist is to find ways to really get people to talk about you in general, talk about how good you are, refer you, because at some point it is gonna bubble up to the level of your local journalist. And I think the same dynamic applies on the national scale. Uh, you know, when, once buzz, you know, buzz starts to build, people are going to start to know about you, but you got to start where you start and just keep working it. What keeps um, you guys from, from writing about everyone that asks, <clears throat> other than pure volume? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's certainly the, uh, the pure volume. Um, I think, you know, part of the role, uh, what Casey was talking about, um, of being a curator is that um, ideally, our readers trust us to turn them on to interesting music to sort of act as a filter. Um, mm -hmm. If we were spending our time writing about everything, I think that kind of lessens the impact of you know the stuff that we're writing about that we actually really do think um, people should be turned on to. Um, you know, we don't really work for like small community papers. You know, it's it's local, um, mm -hmm. but we are you know trying to sort of sift through and you know bring the best music to uh, to our readers' attention. Mm -hmm. I, th I mean, it's, it's partly, you know, there's something of a science to getting our attention maybe with a, a well-designed press release. And, um, but it's also kind of, talk about interpretive dance. It's a little bit interpretive of what we cover. And we Which I'd like to see one day. I could do it right now. We've yeah, got plenty of <laughs> We'll make a DVD extra for, awesome. for after. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, you know, it, there's also a quality to certain music that will strike us mm -hmm. and that's indefinable and something that you don't have control over and I don't entirely have control over I mean, right. it's, so th there's that variable too of you know your ears prick when you either hear buzz going around town about a band or you see somebody live and you're blown away so that's kind of the the monkey wrench into here's how to kind of get our attention right. I mean I guess you could boil it down to the best way to get our attention is write good Right. Don't suck. Don't suck. Right. Okay. Right. We can say suck. <coughs> we can say suck. Yeah. Okay, good. If you can say shit, I can say suck. <laughs> That's three. Um, uh, what, what, you, were, you were touching a little bit upon the, the science and, and the, uh, you know, the mechanics of putting together a proper press release or something like that. Can you touch a little bit more on, on what the uh, specifics of that are? Uh, of a good press release? Yeah. I, I, we may have said this last year, Dan, but I think the idea that simple, Touch on it simpler again. is better. Yeah. Um, <laughs> tell us, you know, who you are. You know, line or two about who you are and what you do. When your show is, you know, maybe in an email a link to some music. High resolution photos, great. Um, keep it simple. Um, kind of relaxed rather than a, f a formal proposal. We're just we're regular. <laughs> Dear Mr. Hollenbeck. Yes, right. Put this rock to your ear. Yeah, but I, I think it's, <laughs> it's kind of like don't, don't overthink it. Just, mm. just say who you are, what you're up to, and maybe a, a little bit about why we should write about you, but don't oversell that because can, that might... Could, you guys, could, could each of you give me an example of, of something that was... Because uh, I remember last year we talked a little bit about having uh, one of the things that impresses a writer or, or turns a, 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 an author's... Eye towards uh, someone you may consider writing about is a story, having a good backstory and things like that. Can you guys give me an example of uh, something that uh, you have read about, someone you have never heard about, that you had written, uh, did a piece on, that caught your eye? What was it that uh, actually, give an example. I don't know if we can actually name names. We'll name names. The, we can uh, say shit. Of their story? <laughs> yeah. Uh, good, good and bad. Like we a story that sides. caught our attention and yeah. made us write about it. Mm -hmm. um, the first article I did on death the band Death. 
Okay, I'm glad you clarified that because I didn't know what you're talking right. about. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I covered funerals for several <laughs> years. But, um, so I got a press release from their label in Chicago, mm -hmm. and many of you probably know the story of death, but the short, very, I'll try to shorten it as much as possible, is uh, the Hackney brothers who were at the time in the band, the reggae band Lamb's Bread, back in the 70s in Detroit were in this proto-punk band before punk was punk, as I think people have referred to it. And um, Bobby Hackney Jr., who many of you know from Ralph Francis and other acts, uh, sort of rediscovered some of their music and, so, and online their music was rediscovered and they, they came back sort of miraculously. And this was just one of, you know, dozens and dozens of publicist emails I get every day, but I was like, holy cow, this is amazing. Mm. I didn't, you know, this is, you know, it was one of those things where you see it and you're like, I have to write about this. And it was, I think it was one of the first stories that was done about them, and then the New York Times wrote about them, and wow. boom, they took off. Um, but that was one of those where, you know, and, and their brother had, who was kind of the um, instigator of the band, had died in the meantime. So, you know, there was a lot of this emotional undercurrent mm. that went into it, you know, that finally his dream has been reached. Unfortunately, he's not here right. you know, to see that we're getting all this attention now. But uh, that was a story definitely where, I mean, I knew about the Hackneys because of their work with Lamb's Bread and I knew Bobby, but um, just that whole story just, it was like, yeah, there's no way I can not write about this. Even if, if the music is terrible, which it's not, it's amazingly powerful, but it's like, this is a story. It goes beyond music. I was also going to use death. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did a story, uh, I guess this was last year, um, about a guy named Jim Rooney. Uh, I don't know if any of you folks would be familiar with him. He's not really a household name, um, but he's a profoundly important figure, uh, especially in Americana music. Uh, and it turns out he lives in the woods in Vermont, and he was giving a tour or uh, giving a talk um, at some Grange Hall, uh, I think in Tunbridge, uh, Vermont. And the guy who runs the hall emailed me. He's like, hey, uh, we're you know, doing this talk with this is guy, Jim Rooney. You might want to look into him. He's, he's kind of interested. And I did, and it turned out that he has kind of been behind the scenes uh, throughout some of the most important moments in like American music history. He was um, instrumental in founding uh, the Newport Folk Festival. Uh, he worked in the, the Boston folk scene um, back when you know that whole thing was blowing up in the 60s. Uh, he went on to become this incredible producer uh, in Nashville. Uh, he worked with Towns Van Zandt and Iris Dement and all of these incredible people. Um, and I never really would have known about him except for, you know, this one little email that, uh, you know, some small town dude happened to send me about a talk that he was giving. Um, so I guess that would be, be my example of, of just kind of out of the blue, uh, wow. cool story developing. I'm going to go in the other direction uh, and, and tell you a little secret. I think music writers, like a lot of other people, are just fundamentally lazy. So we're looking for something <laughs> interesting to talk about and we don't have a lot of time to think about it or whatever. Uh, and it actually kind of drives me crazy because you get stuff that, that's just like, feels like a ready-made story. There's this uh, guy, Jason Isbell, amazing musician, kind of like in the country Americana genre. Um, you know, his record is really, really great, but I got really annoyed at the, at the style of coverage. I mean, it was like basically Johnny Cash, June Carter Cash 101. Like, you know, guy has drinking problem and his wife and his dog leaves him and then he, through the love of a good woman, is redeemed. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> And it's just like, come on, how many times do we have to hear that, that same story? Uh, thank God the music was good, right? Um, so I think that we want to try to resist the, the, the best of us, just like the best of musicians are trying to resist the easy, obvious thing. If you're going to spend time being an original as a musician, then we should at least expect our writers to try to do the same and while we're del delivering narratives and trying to come up with ways to tell you about music. Because the job has fundamentally changed. I mean, when I was uh, working in Burlington at Seven Days, it was right, like kind of in the midst of a shift from CD to just the very beginnings of, of digital. And now, you know, a lot of stuff is, you know, MySpace had just come out when I first started working in the 70s, right? So it was kind of a neat new thing to be able to go like, I can go to a place on the internet and play it, ah! Uh, but now you guys can hear anything that we would write about. Anything that we would ever write about, you can hear instantaneously, pretty much wherever you are, ubiquitously on whatever device you have. 
So that, in some ways, should be keeping the writers honest as well, because we can't just hit you with like a, you know, a, a sack of hyperbole and expect you to like it. You know, <laughs> we have to do a job of like really trying to give you the context and giving you the the reason. I mean, I I do dual stuff when I'm reading music journalism. I'm listening to the thing and I'm reading about it. Uh, you know, and it's like, it, it's an amazing time to live as a fan and somebody who's sorting through this stuff. But you really have to hold writers accountable too. You know, we can't just tell you what it is. We have to do our job and provide a service, and that service, in my opinion, now is becoming context. It used to be gatekeeping, right, back <coughs> in the old days. Hey, look, I'm a prop comic, I told you. Um, um, Charlie uh, <laughs> gave me this right before we went on. It's a copy of Rolling Stone from, you know, 30-something years ago. It's Annie Lennox, right? And back then, the people who wrote for this thing had all the power. Uh, you know, there were just a handful of magazines, and they would, they would uh, make or break you. This is before 90s zine culture. Now I don't think that anybody like thinks that one music writer in the United States of America or on the planet can make a band just like that, just by virtue of, of saying it's good or bad. It's complicated. So, uh, you know, as our roles evolve, I think musicians' roles have to evolve along uh, along with it to make sure that you know we're doing what we should be doing, particularly at the local level, which I keep talking about. Right? Y you guys are kind of helping the town understand itself. And curating, you know, the local cultural phenomenon that is Burlington. Speaking of uh, touching a little bit about how things have changed uh, since the Annie Lennox cover on the Rolling Stones have have uh, things have evolved and things like that. On uh, Dan and Brent, on a on a local level, how has you know social media and and, and you know the internet and technology changed how you guys approach your your jobs and what you do? I'll just wing it without mulling it, <laughs> which is kind of my modus operandi anyway. Um, well, I mean, from, a, from my own perspective, obviously sharing articles on social media mm -hmm. has been a great way for me to reach people who are not necessarily subscribers to or readers of the free press. Um, so I feel like my audience has widened quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So that's great from my perspective and great from a musician's perspective too, sure. obviously. Um, I think from a musician's perspective, uh, social media and online in general is kind of the best of times and the best and the worst of times mm -hmm. because everyone, the good news is everyone can get anything out there and the bad news is anyone Everything can get, get anything, anything out, out there. there. So, and I think talking about gatekeepers or curators mm -hmm. or however you want to put it, that is I think why we're still as relevant as we are, however relevant that may be, is that we can, there's uh, somebody who's in the music world locally who once told me his motto was, I listen to a lot of bad music so you don't have to. And that is to a large degree our job still, mm. to wade through, instead of wading through you know, what Rolling Stone might be featuring, we're wading through what the entire World Wide Web is featuring and hopefully distilling that in some coherent way to say, you know, this is the stuff that we think matters. And you, hopefully we've been doing it long enough so that you can read us and say, well, I know what his predilections are and he's full of crap, or hey, you know, maybe he's onto something. So right. hopefully we can help with that. Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, the Lester Bangs, who said that the reason he writes music criticism, uh, it's not to help a bunch of bands to sell their records, it's to help people from going out and buying those shitty records and then hating his guts and the band's guts uh, <laughs> for telling him that it was good. Um, I think that regardless of the era, um, as awesome as you know, online stuff is, uh, the fundamental uh, gist of the job hasn't really changed you know, since Lester Banks was doing it. Um, what the internet does do is it makes it a lot easier for us to find things. Um, mm. you know, Facebook is an incredible resource for getting breaking news. Um, you know, I've, I've definitely stumbled across stories because some guy in a band posted, hey, I just got signed. Um, they didn't send me a press release. I just happened to be, you know, mm -hmm. perusing Facebook and found that. Um, so it's, you know, it's just another, um, another tool in the tool belt, I guess. Right. You know, I just want to say for the record that Lester Bangs uh, also liked the Guess Who, which is like, <laughs> hey, come on, guy. Uh, the, 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 the social media thing is a double-edged sword. I mean, we can expand our audiences and it's really powerful. On the other hand, the internet and all the sort of SEO kind of 
emphasis uh, as people are trying to figure out how to support journalism through this untested advertising model or you know evolving ad advertising model online means that people are basically <coughs> creating link bait link bait headlines link bait coverage and so on and so forth so you know it can go in either direction I we don't have a lot of time anymore to devote to pouring over stuff we're driven to distraction but um, you know I don't know how much quality music writing you can put in a listicle or a charticle or I'm waiting for the texticle but that hasn't happened yet <laughs> um, but you know so it's kind of like it's kind of like <laughs> it trends in this direction and I think the responsible people who are trying to write about this stuff and, and, and sift through the, the internet uh, you know the world's music uh, need to kind of try to maintain some type of credibility and, and not just fall for that easy temptation of link bait and blurby coverage and just you know this one amazing secret will blow your mind if only you blah and it would be a shame if uh, if music writing ended up in that place because I still think it's so incredibly important just for cultural context understanding ourselves eras that we occupy reasons that go beyond just like you know getting a paycheck or, or you know getting you know famous you know there are really valuable things that that we learn from the experience of uh, reflecting on creative expression and the writers that community that tribe has a job to do and I keep going back to that and I think that that job even if you're at the local level or the national level whatever that looks like anymore is essentially the same and, and I just I mean I'm glad that these guys are still doing it because like it's good to have people who honor that on some level I'm, I'm glad I'm still doing it too by the way we um, are too man <laughs> um, I was before I came down here tonight I was talking with a a local club owner about, um, and I think <clears throat> this has a lot to do with um, the internet and the ability to promote yourself now. And we were talking about the idea that now a lot of musicians are getting so wrapped up in the idea of, oh, I've got this great tool to promote myself. That they're almost putting that over developing their style, their career, their lives, like even before they Fully grow as adults. They're focused on how do I market myself, right. and so I think that's a trap that musicians should probably be aware of. Is you know, don't overdo it. Like right. focus on one step at a time. Yeah, and focus. You know, don't put style over substance, <coughs> and focus on what you're doing first. Mm. And I think to a degree, some of the rest will fall into place if you focus properly on that creative side. Um, and I noticed you guys had a little bit of a disagreement with, uh, you know, guess who and, and who, who thinks who is. Have you guys ever had uh, colleagues, whether you know them or not, disagreed with them and had an article of war? I want to hear about those. <laughs> there are entire <laughs> listservs that exist for really snarky music writers who are just angry at everything, yelling at each other about why their opinion is invalid. I mean, it's like, <laughs> these, these are well-established communities. Um, I, I don't know. It's, uh, it's fun to do that, but I think at the end of the day, there's only so many times you can have the discussion about whether the clash are legitimate or just a bunch of posers. I mean, it's like, you know, we've done that many, many times. There's a lot of new music being made and, and, and what of that new music deserves our attention and, and who, who has been making music the entire, entire time that may not have gotten, you know, the proper uh, attention. So I think that's the more important question. I, I made the Guess Who references because, you know, they're awesome, they're a good band, but Lester Banks seemed to really like them and also not like certain other, like, Really awesome bands, and you know, it's just a little joke. <laughs> no, no actual publications. Anyone's actually oh, I went can tell back you a story. to that. You've you actually story. said you're an idiot. You These people suck. Well, I can tell you a story that <laughs> this is going out live on the web, and I really don't even care. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, buddy. Don't hold back. A, bu a bunch of years ago, um, a bunch <clears throat> of years ago when I was writing for Dusted Magazine, I did a review of a band that was on Matador, and I'm not gonna say the name of the band, but I kinda just basically ripped it apart. And I ripped it apart because it was the first time, in my opinion, that I'd see, heard something on Matador that had basically cloned another Matador band. It was a copycat of something that they had ar already put out. And, and you know, for a label that I respected so much, um, you know, I kind of razzed them in the article. I was basically taunting them, like, you, Sub Pop wouldn't do this, <laughs> right? And uh, the, the, the owner of the label got really, really mad at me. Mad at me to the extent that he kind of just like, I don't know, 
internet stalked me for a handful of years after that and he would just show up and say obnoxious things like he would find me online and harass me for for like razzing on his band and I just thought that was kind of funny because that is people take music really really seriously so yes anytime anyone has an opinion about music someone's gonna you know probably go home in tears awesome good times um, we're getting towards a little bit of the end. I just wanted to talk a little bit more about um, uh, about uh, an effective or non-effective way to follow up. So I, I am a I'm a singer-songwriter. I'm in a band, and I I've uh, I've honed my craft. I've I've tackled the local scene. I'm even doing things more on a regional level. And I'm I'm you know whether I'm local or or approach you from out of town, and um, you either have deleted or not deleted, and I haven't heard back. What is a good effective Nice way to follow up. Send you another rock? Bigger one? Through the window. <laughs> <laughs> Through the window. <laughs> nice. You don't call me anymore, you bitch. Um, Whoops. <laughs> four and a half? That's four. Um, I would say uh, just to use you know, common sense and common courtesy. Yeah, not too common, though. That's why uh, I asked. Well, <laughs> that's true. I mean, you, you know, it's... It's a fine line between you know being persistent and badgering someone. Um, at any given moment, you know we've got hundreds of emails in our inbox asking exactly the same thing hmm. that you're asking. And you know any given week, in my case, or daily in Brent's, you know we can have ten different balls in the air, and you know five of those things are going to land in the paper. Um, mm -hmm. If you are a working musician, if you're coming through town a bunch, there's probably going to be another opportunity at some point down the line if we don't get to you this time. So. Don't get discouraged mm. if we don't write about you the first time that you ask or the second time that you ask. Um, eventually, we're probably going to get around to you. Um, in terms of just you know following up, it never hurts to send. If you haven't heard you know back in a, in a few days, send mm. another email just making sure that the email got through, checking mm -hmm. in. Um, you know, if we still don't get back to you, um, it might just be that we're not interested and we were too busy to respond. That happens sometimes. Um, sometimes things fall through the cracks. Um, you know, a lot of us are recovered musicians, so if you think about your musician friends, they're not exactly the most reliable people, so <laughs> that can happen too. Um, hey now, <laughs> come on now. Um, but yeah, I would, I would say, you know, be, be polite and persistent and, uh, and don't necessarily you know, take it too don't hard. Don't stalk you or throw a rock a through a window. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. And I, I try to respond to every email that is a personal email, like I was talking about the ones where it's clearly cut and paste, I may not respond to those. But if it's a local musician who sends me a singular email, I try to always, re always respond. So if I don't, it may be that I didn't get the email or forgot it somehow. So it's definitely worth a gentle reminder, I think, if you don't hear back, just to yeah. say, hey, you know, sent you that note a couple of weeks ago, was wondering what you thought. No harm in that, so, definitely. So not replying every couple of hours, that's, that's bad. A couple yeah. days is good. A couple of weeks might be better than, you know, that's 20 bad. minutes later, right. Awesome. One other thing that you can do on the research side is if, you, if you're doing this by yourself, um, this is something that you can take you know, into your own, under your own steam. Like, if you're local, it, you know, figure out what Dan's um, you know, publication schedule is. It's a weekly, right? There's the, they have lead time. They, go into, they, they plan their editorial meetings early, uh, at this time, and then the issue comes out on, what, Wednesday still? And then the, you know, Brent's got a different um, rhythm to his job that's a daily. And that's so now point. we have other opportunities. We have blogs and other platforms that we could say, well, couldn't make that in the paper, but we might be able to put that on the blog. I'm sure you've said that a bunch of times. And so, you know, just being polite and being courteous is good. Like, just treat, you know, the music journalist how you'd like to be treated. Nobody likes, you know, people being pushy and in their face and then acting like, can I say butthurt on the internet? You can. About, um, we about won't count like, that not one. getting coverage because oftentimes you, I have had t moments at seven days when I was there, like, where I actually really did want to cover something. And I kind of felt bad because the pr production schedule just couldn't accommodate it based on what day of the week it rose to my attention and what we had already blocked out for the paper. So it, you're not doing anybody uh, but yourself a disservice if you get really mad at that and treat the, the journalist or writer like a jerk, you know, because, some, you know, I'm pretty sure that, like, at the local level, you know, these guys exist to try to cover music in this community. And so, you know, as long as you respect that, then they, can, they will respect you. Um, would you find it, I know we touched a little bit this, on this last, uh, last time we talked about the press. It, is it appropriate, let's just say someone like myself 
doesn't get a, a response or, or does get one and it's something, you know, it just gets, you know, bypassed or something like that. <laughs> what would happen if I tried to Facebook friend you? That bad? I mean, we're all friends here, so I can say that, but what happens if we weren't? Uh, Where's the line? I think we're Facebook friends. We are. Right? I think yeah. we all are. So, I mean, friend is, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> it, it means you're in touch with each other. I use Facebook a lot for reaching mm. out to people if I'm want to do an interview with somebody. Is it considered professionally inappropriate? No. Okay. I don't, personally, I don't think so, because anything that helps me at a moment's notice know how to get a hold of somebody mm -hmm. I may need to get a hold of is a tool I need to use for my right. job. So <clears throat> I think it's very handy. So I don't, I don't take the friend thing literally, because right. you know, there's, there's an old saying that journalists have no friends, because right. we need to... I'm your friend, though, dude. And it's, it's partly because we're really unsavory people, but it's also partly that we <laughs> can't quite establish truly deep friendships with people we write about or might write about. Well, we're, we're pretty close, Steve, but yeah. Um, but so, yeah, I think, you know, as lo you, we, I don't take the Facebook friend thing literally. It's, right. it's more of a way of staying in touch with mm -hmm. people, and I think that's perfectly right. reasonable. Just don't tag me in your show poster. I hate that. <laughs> That's pretty much. I don't know how to tag. Yeah, actually, you don't have yeah, anything about that. Also, um, Sometimes, yeah, posting something directly to my page yeah. is a little annoying. Yeah. I think that, speaking of being a curator, I kind of curate my own page, so that would be right. something to avoid posting. Right. Not not just tagging, but actually sending it to my home page might be right. a little, little too much. Okay. Probably depends on the writer. Like, if you're in the local community, you can kind of know what makes them tick and how they respond once you develop those working relationships. Yeah, it sucks. We don't get to be friends with anybody, and it's very, very lonely. But on the other hand, if you're a misanthrope, <laughs> it's a wonderful job. <laughs> and I can say that as, as someone who's both a misanthrope and a former music writer. Uh, I'm not really. But anyway, it depends on the person. Like, for example, I don't pick up the phone. I don't care how many voicemails you leave. Like, even at my job, like, I have people who are like, just take my, vo I mean, I hate to say this, they check my voicemail for me, it's terrible. I won't, I won't pick up the phone, I, I don't do it. Like if somebody needs to talk to me like about something, they schedule a time and we schedule a time to take the call and, and consummate that verbal transaction. Uh, but I will answer every email and I will do it at three o'clock in the morning because I'm just that weird, you know? So that's my rhythm, uh, everybody else is different. Some people like to limit their electronic communications and not be like checking Facebook status updates at dinner and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but that's not me, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, we'll take a couple of minutes to take some questions. Does uh, anyone in the audience have any questions? I'm going to have to repeat the question because, uh, oh, all oh, right. You're first. We have an album coming out. You do? Yeah, what would you guys recommend for people that are releasing their first album um, that don't have uh, excellent friends like that? You're not Facebook friends like I am. Yeah, okay. Not I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat the question. So uh, there's uh, someone in the audience who is releasing your, their debut album. And is uh, looking to have, uh, what, what recommendation do you have to be able to help press that and promote that? Right? This would be okay. one of those instances where, you know, knowing the press that you're approaching um, comes in handy. Um, so a paper like Seven Days, we almost exclusively uh, review local records. Um, I, don't, I think the last time we reviewed anything that wasn't made in Vermont was like four years ago. Um, so if wow. it's local, we will review it. Um, so really all you need to do is send it my way um, with you know, an email, introducing yourself, tell me a little bit about your background. Um, it always helps to have, like, you know, if you've got upcoming shows, um, we are a newspaper, so we try to create a news hook when we can, and the live show often will qualify. Um, but that's, that's about all you need to do, and that kind of you know, makes the introduction for you, um, at least in seven days' case. Yeah, we're a little bit different at the Free Press. Um, I don't do as many CD reviews as seven days does. I'll do occasional ones, and generally they tie into uh, a show that's coming up. The, our entertainment section that comes out on Thursday is called Weekend, and um, it's very um, things you can do oriented. So it's, it's more likely I will do a CD review tying in with a show that's coming up that weekend, for instance. Um, so, but, other, but because I don't do a lot of CD reviews, you know, there's, you know, I may do uh, a highlight of a CD release show coming up. So it may not be a review per se, but 
that's a way of getting attention for the fact that you have a CD out and that you have the show coming up. You know what's really cool? Um, like these guys were talking about how they, they do that and how they would treat that situation. But uh, I've been on panels like this with folks, at, you know, at the national level, um, and you know we have a lot of music journalists come in at our uh, Future of Music Summit in D.C. every year to talk about where this stuff is heading because we all recognize that you know music journalism is a huge part of like a healthy, sustainable uh, cultural ecosystem to use buzzwords. So it's important, but. The, the folks that I talk to at the national level, like, you know, Bob Boylan from NPR, he does it the same way that these guys do it, you know? Like, they, they, they're looking to fulfill certain things for their publication and their audience, and if you know what those are, you can kind of help them help you, and so that goes into the research part of it. But these people are really great, you know? Like, they're, they're into music. Uh, Chris Richards at the Washington Post does so much for local bands. You have no idea. He hosts shows. He's very involved in the scene. I have a friend that's a jazz critic, and he like will like get. He has stacks of CDs this high, and his one goal in life is to literally actually give every single one of them a listen within the calendar year that he received those CDs. I mean, that's a Herculean task, and you know that's what I mean. Like, don't don't take the don't expect the person on the other end is a chump because they're they're holding the keys. They're like people who will work with you. You just have to figure out how to work with them. Good, sweet, yes, sir. Does the cultural department speak to advertising? Uh, first of all, uh, Don uh, mentioned that a month's lead time is good, and mm -hmm. uh, you're very good at that, Don. That's very helpful. And uh, this, the sooner you can do it, the better. There's almost not too early. Mm -hmm. um, do we speak to advertising? Passing in the hall, yes, but about content, no. It decidedly does not, in my case, sir. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I would say that's true from my experience, but with a caveat. The old school rules of journalism, that it's almost like a code, it's like an ethical code. Uh, you know, we could get into a duel, too, like we throw our gloves on the ground and, and that's how it goes. But, I mean, there, <laughs> there's rules that we called it church and state, right? Like, you know, advertising and, and editorial are, are, you know, bifurcated necessarily. Online, you don't know. You really don't know, and that's right. kind of the insidious aspect of this, you know, sort of uh, link-driven culture. Uh, but I think that the best uh, and the most established publications, even if they do have an online presence, and even if they end up migrating fully to an online environment, are going to maintain some of those standards because it's a, it's important to have integrity doing that work. Hmm. Great, gentlemen uh, in the back. So the, the question is uh, the differences and preferences of, of uh, sending press kits. Do we send you uh, an attachment that has a Bible of your press kit, or do we send something that's an in-body, you know, uh, broken down, cliff noted version with uh, you know, few reviews and uh, picture and things like that, or uh, with a link? What do you guys prefer? Is that not a down for you? I prefer things as simple and uncluttered as possible. Um, I'm a little dense, so if there's too much stuff, then well, you know, I, might, I might miss it. Um, so as, as, sim as simply as you can do it, the better. Um, I also like to be able to access more information easily if I need it. So if you want to include a link um, to you know, your, your wealth of other uh, materials, that's great too, um, but it doesn't necessarily clutter up my inbox when I'm going through it. I would uh, <clears throat> wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, in the body of the email is fine. Mm -hmm. Multiple attachments can, maybe because I'm dense too, can clutter <laughs> up my brain as well as my inbox. Um, I, so a 
body of the email would be fine, but I do think a, uh, if you can send a high resolution photo, I think that's great because if I'm going to write about a band, it, it will need a photo. And if we don't have one, if you're a new band or one that we haven't written about before, um, we'll need something if we're going to write about you. So there's no harm in sending a one megabyte photo as far as I'm concerned. Um, and definitely keep the, the body of the email as succinct as possible. I always preferred getting the photo link, and in this day and age, you have more tools to do that. You have no excuse not to have. You know, you can get cloud storage really uh, cheaply. You know, you can. You, a lot of this stuff is there's user face products that can help you execute all that stuff if you want. But I think Dan is right, and, and Brent's right. Like the email itself should be pretty short and sweet. The press release shouldn't be like 47 pages. Less attachments are probably better. Um, and you know, this is a criticism I'll throw at like major labels and folks who should know better, folks with like really expensive publicists. They'll send you a link to something and you know, they're so worried about piracy or whatever that they make you go through 47,000 hoops of verification to get to a stream of an advance of something and it's like, no, <laughs> I'm not gonna do that. Like, so even the big folks screw that stuff up from time to time. So anything you do to make it easier for us to understand what we're looking at uh, is probably better. Yeah. Um. I'll touch on that a little bit as a singer-songwriter. I press releases and, and trying to get gigs. Uh, I follow what they've said, short and sweet. I do. I usually do put a picture in in the body of the email, but I always just put a link um, to my website because everything that anybody needs to know about me is on my website. Calendar, bio, news, uh, everything is on there. So, sure. Yes, sir. Um, so the question is, um, I think it's twofold. What what is what is it that would drive you to click on a link if one is, pr is provided in an email, and what are the differences? Uh, what what the chances are, and the difference between having a paper press kit sent versus uh, something digitally sent? Uh, so the first question is, what, click what on a link. What makes and well, that that kind of goes to, you know, the what I was saying earlier about there's some. Science the content of to the email. Yeah. getting our attention, and there's some variables to it, and one of them may be time. I yeah. mean, sometimes if I'm opening an email and I'm pressed for time, I'll see that there's four links, and I might be like, oh, I don't, I don't have time for that right now, and I'll get back to it later, and mm. you may or you may not. So I think you don't want to overdo it with the links. Um, the second question was relating to paper. Paper. Well, Hard yes. Hard, yeah. Um, when was the last one you got one? Well, I got one yesterday, actually. Wow. That so it still happens. Well, I mean, I, 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 well, I, get, I, 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 this was very old school, like when you were at Seven Days, Casey, the, the <coughs> folder with the description inside and a glossy photo. And it was like I felt like I'd been put in a time machine. It was so weird. And when I started covering music in 2004, that <coughs> was everything. And if you had that glossy photo, it was like, great, there's a glossy photo. That's just what I need. I don't have to track this down. And I looked at it, and I'm like, I don't even think we have a scanner in the office anymore. I'm not, I'm not sure <laughs> we can do anything with this. So I'll have to take a picture of the picture <laughs> with my iPhone and see if it works. That's great. So, um, so I think you don't want to go that old school, but for me personally, receiving a CD in the mail with a note is actually pretty good because I know it's a personal touch and right. it makes it feel a little bit more approachable in a way. Would it be too much to follow up with a digital if they sent, first sent one? 
I'm just touching on, on your, your paper, your, your paper, sending a paper one first, a hard copy one. And then uh, I, th I think as Dan and I were saying earlier, the, give follow -up, a couple days. the gentle follow-up is never a bad thing. In okay. fact, it's a, it's a good thing. And in fact, the right. person who brought the um, nostalgic yeah. uh, piece yesterday uh, <laughs> called me today to make sure I got it because I wasn't in the office when he dropped it right. off. So I, and that's totally cool. And I mm. think if we have, I mean, just like we're having a conversation now, if you have a conversation rather than just a series of emails exchanged, right. I think that's always a good, healthy yeah. thing. For sure. There was a website that was around, I don't know if it's still around, but it had, uh, it collected all like kind of the worst glossies uh, of all time and like, and like bands, you know, this, how many shots of bands can you see standing on a train trestle or in front of a brick wall kind of thing? Um, but I like the idea of taking a picture of the picture of it because then you can do cool stuff with Instagram and give it weird filters and just take control of it. Um, the, I, I, the, the first part of your question is about like links and I think what you could separate in your mind is uh, some of the stuff that you were describing on your website would probably be really great for your super fans. Those are the people that you're, you're servicing and satisfying with that depth of content and richness of material and range of material. And then there's the folks who are in a hurry and just need to know about you and whatever. So you don't want to uh, deluge the, uh, you know, the, uh, the latter group with the former content. And the physical media is kind of funny. The way I used to do it, like, yeah, I might review something if I literally walked into the pile of CDs at my house or like elbowed it on my desk for the 10th time. I'm like, oh, you, fine, I'll review you. <laughs> uh, so you could probably bury them under CDs and maybe hope that they will catch their attention just because they're klutzy. But uh, in this day and age, you don't have to. I got an eight track cassette in the tape or in the, uh, in the mail about a month ago. <laughs> I have a player at home if you need All right, we'll, uh, we'll hang out and we'll, uh, we'll listen to that. Um, was it a Doobie Brothers album? No, it was actually uh, it was the Aerolites, actually, local bands called the Aerolites. I had already reviewed their record, but in my, at the end of my column, there's like a little thing that says what's on my turntable, iPod, 8-track player. It's supposed to be a little funny, but they took it seriously. So. Nice. Okay. I think we'll take one more. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. I think the question is, uh, it can be simplified in the sense of which is the best medium to send you? CD, link, 45, 8-track. Right. I like the 45 myself. <laughs> I still got one with the player, if you need one of those. Uh, I think as long as the entire package is accessible digitally, um, so that includes album art, uh, liner notes, all that kind of stuff. Um, Digital is great. Um, I also still listen to CDs, um, so having the physical thing in my hand is kind of nice too. Um, but as long as all the all the other stuff is there and it sounds good, um, then digital is totally cool. I, for a while, was a CD only kind of guy, just because I felt like having it on my desk, even if it's in the pile that Casey would <laughs> knock over, um, was knocked over your pile. well, uh, you know. Just in case the tremor of your pile knocked mine over. Um, uh, but uh, so for a long time, I felt like just having that visual reminder on my desk rather than on my desktop or somewhere buried in the bowels of my desktop computer, um, that that was the better thing. But I've, I'm kind of getting more used to the idea of rather than it being there as a reminder, I need to go and remind myself, oh yeah, I need to, to right. listen to that. So I think basically either way is fine. That sounds like a really wishy-washy, pointless answer. But I, th I think, and I think you're kind of saying that to an extent too, Dan, that as long as, to me it's like, uh, you know, the, if you're taking a vacation, the vehicle's not impo important. It's, you know, you don't go to the Grand Canyon and say, wow, what an amazing Cadillac we rode through the Grand Canyon in. You're going to see the Grand Canyon. So it's about the music rather than the mode of delivery, as far as I'm concerned. Either is fine, a track would be cool. I, I haven't gotten the a track so I'm a little jealous. Nice. My MacBook Air doesn't even have a drive in it, so it's kind of weird, like if like the main environment where you're sitting around, or I am with the computer. I mean, I don't write about music as much anymore, I still freelance now and again, but, but it's actually kind of less convenient for me to get a CD than it would be a, a link to music. 
uh, because I'm already in the environment where I have my headphones on, I'm listening to stuff streaming in the cloud, or you know, or you know, I, I'm barely actually even going into my iTunes library anymore, mm. um, you know, because there's the access model is is developing that makes it kind of easy just to get it streaming online. So. I think that will continue to develop. Then one question to ask yourself is how essential is your physical product? Um, if there's something really special about your CD, even though people think CDs are a dead format, not necessarily. I mean, if your pack CD package is really unique, interesting, uh, and it stands out, and it's aesthetically you know, powerful or conveys something, then that might, and, and that coincides with the music being good, you know, that could be something that can elevate that CD to a, to a higher, uh, level in a, in a journalist or a writer's mind. And that's actually kind of hard to do with links, because links are just links. Uh, they're generic. A lot of the pages, like, no matter how great your web page is, uh, you know, it's just a web page. It's a convenient thing. Um, whereas, like, a physical object still can have, like, a, an aesthetic quality to it. Brent likes having the physical item. A lot of people still do. It's, it's why vinyl is big. But, obviously, it's not terribly cost-effective to be sending vinyl pro promos to, to music writers. Okay. Uh, four minutes. Okay, we have time. Anybody else have any, any, any other questions? I know that there was. What's that? Oh, four minutes to the next act. So we're actually out of time. So um, thank you so much for everybody. Just to give a little, little recap. Um, uh, cultivate your local, uh, your local scene first, um, and um, and reach out to your to your, your local journalists and things like that as you're branching out. Uh, sending uh, digital versus CD, I think, is really just a matter of, uh, of preference. Um, uh, keeping the email content kind of simple, short, sweet, be polite, don't follow up every hour, send a rock, that's good. Um, and that's pretty much it. Thank you so much, everybody, for, for being here. Casey, Dan, Brent, good to see you guys again. My name is Steve Hartman. Please stick around for Marisa Smith, and uh, we'll see you guys soon. Thanks so much. Take care.